The Dying of the Dragons, Rhaenyra Overthrown. Back in King's Landing, Queen Rhaenyra was finding herself ever more isolated with every new betrayal. The suspected turncloak Adam Valerian had fled before he could be put to the question. His flight proved his guilt, the White Worm murmured. Lord Keltigar concurred and proposed a punishing new tax on any child born out of wedlock. Such a tax would not only replenish the crown's coffers, but might also rid the realm of thousands of bastards. Her grace had more pressing concerns than her treasury, however. By ordering the arrest of Adam Valerian, she had lost not only a dragon, and a dragon rider, but her queen's hand as well, and more than half the army that had sailed from Dragonstone to seize the Iron Throne was made up of men sworn to House Valerian. When it became known that Lord Corlys languished in a dungeon under the Red Keep, they began to abandon her cause by the hundreds. Some made their way to Cobbler Square to join the throngs gathered around the Shepherd, whilst others slipped through postern gates or over the walls intent on making their way back to Driftmark. Nor could those who remained be trusted. That was proved when two of the Sea Snake's sworn swords, Sir Dennis Woodwright and Sir Thorin True, cut their way into the dungeons to free their lord. Their plans were betrayed to Lady Misery by a whore Sir Thorin had been betting, and the would-be rescuers were taken and hanged. The two knights died at dawn, kicking and writhing against the walls of the Red Keep as the nooses tightened round their necks. That very day, not long after sunset, another horror visited the Queen's court. Helena Targaryen, sister, wife, and queen to King Aegon II and mother of his children, threw herself from her window in Maegor's Holdfast to die impaled upon the iron spikes that lined the dry moat below. She was but one and twenty. After half a year of captivity, why should Aegon's queen choose this night to end her life? Mushroom asserts that Helena was with child after her days and nights of being sold for a common whore. But this explanation is only as credible as his tale of the brothel queens, which is to say, not credible at all. Grand Maester Munkin believes the horror of seeing Sir Thorin and Sir Dennis die drove her to the act. But if the young queen knew the two men, it could only have been as jailers, and there is no evidence that she was a witness to their hanging. Septim Eustace suggests that Lady Myceria, the White Worm, chose this night to tell Helena of the death of her son Maelor and the grisly manner of his passing, though what motive she would have had for doing so, beyond simple malice, is hard to fathom. Maesters may argue about the truth of such assertions, but on that fateful night, a darker tale was being told in the streets and alleys of King's Landing, in inns and brothels and pot shops, even holy septs. Queen Helena had been murdered, the whispers went, and her sons had been before her. Prince Darien and his dragon would soon be at the gates, and with them, the end of Rhaenyra's reign. The old queen was determined that her young half-sister should not live to revel in her downfall, so she had sent Sir Luther Largent to seize Helena with his huge rough hands and fling her from the window onto the spikes below. Whence came this poisonous calumny, one might ask, for a calumny it most certainly is. Grand Maester Munkin places it at the door of the shepherd, for thousands heard him decry both crime and queen. But did he originate the lie, or was he merely giving echo to the words heard from other lips? The latter, Mushroom would have us believe. A slander so vile could only have been the work of Larry Strong, the dwarf asserts, for the clubfoot had never left King's Landing, as would soon be revealed, but only slipped into the shadows from whence he continued to plot and whisper. Could Helena's death have been murder? Possibly, but it seems unlikely Queen Rhaenyra was behind it. Helena Targaryen was a broken creature who posed no threat to her grace, nor do our sources speak of any special enmity between them. If Rhaenyra were intent on murder, surely it would have been the Dowager Queen Alicent flung down onto the spikes. Moreover, at the time of Queen Helena's death, we have abundant proof that Sir Luther Largent 
The purported killer was eating with 300 of his gold cloaks at the barracks by the gate of the gods. All the same, the rumor of Queen Helena's, quote, murder was soon on the lips of half King's Landing. That it was so quickly believed shows how utterly the city had turned against their once beloved queen. Rhaenyra was hated. Helena had been loved. Nor had the common folk of the city forgotten the cruel murder of Prince Jaehaerys by blood and cheese, and the terrible death of Prince Maelor at Bitterbridge. Helena's end had been mercifully swift. One of the spikes took her through the throat, and she died without a sound. At the moment of her death, across the city atop the Hill of Rhaenys, her dragon, Dreamfire, rose suddenly with a roar that shook the dragon pit, snapping two of the chains that bound her. When Dowager Queen Alicent was informed of her daughter's passing, she rent her garments and pronounced a dire curse upon her rival. That night, King's Landing rose in bloody riot. The rioting began amidst the alleys and winds of Flea Bottom, as men and women poured from the wine sinks, rat pits, and pot shops by the hundreds, angry, drunken, and afraid. From there, the rioters spread throughout the city, shouting for justice for dead princes and their murdered mother. Carts and wagons were overturned, shops looted, homes plundered, and set afire. Gold cloaks attempting to quell the disturbances were set upon and beaten bloody. No one was spared, of high birth or low. Lords were pelted with rubbish. Knights pulled from their saddles. Lady Darla Deddings saw her brother Davos stabbed through the eye, where he tried to defend her from three drunken ostlers intent on defiling her. Sailors, unable to return to their ships, attacked the river gates and fought a pitched battle with the city watch. It took Sir Luther Largent and 400 spears to disperse them. By then, the gate had been hacked half to pieces and a hundred men were dead or dying. A quarter of them, gold cloaks. No such rescuers came for Lord Bartimos Keltigar, whose walled manse was defended only by six guardsmen and a few hastily armed servants. When rioters came swarming over the walls, these dubious defenders threw down their weapons and ran, or joined the attackers. Arthur Keltigar, a boy of fifteen, made a brave stand in a doorway, sword in hand, and kept the howling mob at bay for a few moments until a treacherous serving girl let the rioters in through a back way. The brave lad was slain by a spear thrust through the back. Lord Bartimos himself fought his way to the stables, only to find all his horses dead or stolen. Taken, the queen's despised master of coin was bound to a post and tortured until he revealed where all of his wealth was hidden. Then, a tanner called Watt announced that his lordship had failed to pay his quote, cock tax, and must yield his manhood to the crown as forfeit. At Cobbler Square, the sound of the riot would be heard from every quarter. The shepherd drank deep of the anger, proclaiming that the day of doom was nigh at hand, just as he had foretold, and calling down the wrath of the gods upon this quote, a natural queen who sits bleeding on her iron throne, her whore's lips glistening and red with the blood of her sweet sister. When a scepter in the crowd cried out, pleading for him to save the city, the shepherd only said, Only the mother's mercy can save you, but you drove your mother from this city with your pride and lust and avarice. Now it is the stranger who comes, on a dark horse with burning eyes he comes, a scourge of fire in his hand to cleanse this pit of sin, of demons, and all who bow before them. Listen, can you hear the sound of burning hooves? He comes, he comes. The crowd took up the cry, wailing, he comes, he comes as a thousand torches filled the square with pools of smoky yellow light. Soon enough, the shouts died away, and through the night, the sound of iron hooves on cobblestone grew louder. Not one, stranger, but five hundred, Mushroom says in his testimony. The city watch had come in strength. Five hundred men clad in black ring mail, steel caps, and long golden cloaks, armed with short swords, spears, and spiked cudgels. 
They formed up on the south side of the square, behind a wall of shields and spears. At their head rode Sir Luthor Largent upon an armored war horse, a longsword in his hand. The mere sight of him was enough to send hundreds streaming away into the winds and alleys and side streets. Hundreds more fled when Sir Luthor ordered the gold cloaks to advance. Ten thousand remained, however. The press was so thick that many who might gladly have fled found themselves unable to move, pushed and shoved and trod upon. Others surged forward, locked arms, and began to shout and curse as the spears advanced to the slow beat of a drum. Make way, you bloody fools! Sir Luther roared at the shepherd's lambs. Go home! No harm will come to you! Go home! We only want this shepherd! Some say the first man to die was a baker, who grunted in surprise when a spear point pierced his flesh, and he saw his apron turning red. Others claim it was a little girl, trodden under by Sir Luther's warhorse. A rock came flying from the crowd, striking a spearman on the brow. Shouts and curses were heard. Sticks and stones and chamber pots came raining down from rooftops, an archer across the square began to loose his shafts. A torch was thrust at a watchman, and quick as that, his golden cloak was burning. On the far side of Cobbler's Square, the shepherd was bundled away by his acolytes. Stop him! Sir Luther shouted. Seize him! Stop him! He spurred his horse, cutting his way through the throng, and his gold cloaks followed discarding their spears to draw swords and cudgels. The shepherd's followers were screaming, falling, running. Others produced weapons of their own, dirks and daggers, mauls and clubs, broken spears and rusted swords. The gold cloaks were large men, young, strong, disciplined, well-armed and armored. For twenty yards or more, their shield wall held, and they cut a bloody road through the crowd, leaving dead and dying all around them. But they numbered only five hundred, and ten thousand had gathered to hear the shepherd. One watchman went down, then another. Suddenly, small folk were slipping through the gaps in their line, screaming curses. The shepherd's flock attacked with knives and stones, even teeth, swarming over the city watch and around their flanks, attacking from behind, flinging tiles down from roofs and balconies. Battle turned to riot, turned to slaughter. Surrounded on all sides, the gold cloaks found themselves hemmed in and swept under, with no room to wield their weapons. Many died on the points of their own swords. Others were torn to pieces, kicked to death, trampled underfoot, hacked apart with hoes and butcher's cleavers. Even the fearsome Sir Luther Largent could not escape the carnage. His sword torn from his grasp, Largent was pulled from his saddle, stabbed in the belly, and bludgeoned to death with a cobblestone. His helm and head so crushed that it was only by its size that his body was recognized when the corpse wagons came the next day. During that long night, Septim Eustace tells us, the shepherd held sway over half the city, whilst strange lords and kings of misrule squabbled o'er the rest. Hundreds of men gathered round Wat the Tanner, who rode through the streets on a white horse, brandishing Lord Keltigar's severed head and bloody member, and declaring an end to all taxes. In a brothel, on the street of silk, the whores raised up their own king, a pale-haired boy of four named Gaiman, supposedly a bastard of the missing King Aegon II. Not to be outdone, a hedge knight named Sir Perkin the Flea crowned his own squire, Tristane, a stripling of sixteen years, declaring him to be a natural son of the late King Viserys. Any knight can make a knight, and when Sir Perkin began dubbing every sellsword, thief, and butcher's boy who flocked to Tristane's ragged banner, men and boys appeared by the hundreds to pledge themselves to his cause. By dawn, fires were burning throughout the city. Cobbler's Square was littered with corpses, and bands of lawless men roamed Flea Bottom, breaking into shops and homes and laying rough hands on every honest person they encountered. The surviving gold cloaks had retreated to their barracks, whilst gutter knights, mummer kings, and mad prophets ruled the streets. Like the roaches they resembled, 
The worst of these fled before the light, retreating to hidden hidey holes and cellars to sleep off their drunks, divvy up their plunder, and wash the blood off their hands. The gold cloaks at the old gate and the dragon gate sallied forth under the command of their captains, Sir Balon Birch and Sir Garth the Hare Lip, and by midday had managed to restore some semblance of order to the streets north and east of Rainus's Hill. Sir Medric Manderley, leading a hundred White Harbor men, did the same for the area northeast of Egon's High Hill, down to the Iron Gate. The rest of King's Landing remained in chaos. When Sir Torin Manderley led his northmen down from the hook, they found Fishmongerer Square and River Row swarming with Sir Perkin's gutter knights. At the river gate, King Tristane's ragged banner flew above the battlements, whilst the bodies of the captain and three of his sergeants hung from the gatehouse. The remainder of the Mudfoot garrison had gone over to Sir Perkin. Sir Torin lost a quarter of his men fighting his way back to the Red Keep, yet escaped lightly compared to Sir Laurent Marbrand, who led a hundred knights and men-at-arms into Flea Bottom. Sixteen returned. Sir Laurent, Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard, was not amongst them. By evenfall, Rhaenyra Targaryen found herself sore besets on every side, her reign in ruins. The Queen wept when they told her how Sir Laurent died, Mushroom testifies. But she raged when she learned that Maidenpool had gone over to the foe, that the girl Nettles had escaped, and that her own beloved consort had betrayed her. And she trembled when Lady Myceria warned her against the coming dark, that this night would be worse than the last. At dawn, a hundred men attended her in the throne room, but one by one they slipped away, or were dismissed, until only her sons and I remained with her. My faithful mushroom, her grace called me. Would that all my men were as true as you, I should make you my hand. When I replied that I would sooner be her consort, she laughed. No sound was ever sweeter. It was good to hear her laugh. Munkin's true-telling says not of the queen laughing, only that her grace swung from rage to despair and back again, clutching so desperately at the iron throne that both her hands were bloody by the time the sun set. She gave command of the gold cloaks to Sir Balon Birch, captain at the Iron Gate, sent ravens to Winterfell and the Eyrie pleading for more aid, ordering that a decree of attainer be drawn up against the Moutons of Maidenpool, and named the young Sir Glendon Good Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard, though only twenty, and a member of the White Swords for less than a moon's turn. Good had distinguished himself during the fighting in Flea Bottom earlier that day. It was he who brought back Sir Laurent's body to keep the rioters from despoiling it. Though the Fool Mushroom does not figure in Septim Eustace's account of the last day, nor in Munkin's true telling, both speak of the Queen's sons. Aegon the Younger was ever at his mother's side, yet seldom spoke a word. Prince Joffrey, ten and three, donned squire's armor and begged the queen to let him ride into the dragon pit and mount Tyraxes. I want to fight for you, mother, as my brothers did. Let me prove that I am as brave as they are. His words only deepened Rhaenyra's resolve, however. Brave they were, and dead they are, the both of them. My sweet boys. And once more, her grace forbade the prince to leave the castle. With the setting of the sun, the vermin of King's Landing emerged once more from their rat pits, hidey holes, and cellars in even greater numbers than the night before. On Visenya's hill, an army of whores bestowed their favors freely on any man willing to swear his sword to game and pale hair. King Cunny, in the vulgar parlance of the city. At the river gate, Sir Perkin feasted his gutter knights on stolen food and led them down the riverfront, looting wharves and warehouses and any ship that had not put to sea. Even as Wat the Tanner led his own mob of howling ruffians against the gate of the gods, Though King's Landing boasted massive walls and stout towers, they had been designed to repel attacks from outside the city, 
not from within its walls. The garrison at the Gate of the Gods was especially weak, as their captain and a third of their number had died with Sir Luther Largent in Cobbler's Square. Those who remained, many wounded, were easily overcome. Watt's followers poured out into the countryside, streaming up the King's Road behind Lord Keltigar's rotting head, toward where not even Watt seemed certain. Before an hour passed, the King's Gate and the Lion Gate were opened as well. The gold cloaks at the first had fled, whilst the lions, at the other hand, had thrown in with the mobs. Three of the seven gates of King's Landing were open to Rhaenyra's foes. The most dire threat to the Queen's rule proved to be within the city, however. At nightfall, the shepherd had appeared once more to resume his preaching in Cobbler's Square. The corpses from last night's fighting had been cleared away during the day, we are told, but not before they had been looted of their clothes and coin and other valuables, and in some cases, of their heads as well. As the one-handed prophet shrieked his curses at the vile queen in the Red Keep, a hundred severed heads looked up at him, swaying atop tall spears and sharpened staves. The crowd, Septim Eustace says, was twice as large and thrice as fearful as the night before. Like the queen they so despised, the shepherd's lambs were looking to the sky with dread, fearing that King Aegon's dragon would arrive before the night was out. With him, an army close behind. No longer believing that the queen could protect them, they looked to their shepherd for salvation. But that prophet answered, When the dragons come, your flesh will burn and blister and turn to ash. Your wives will dance in gowns of fire, shrieking as they burn, lewd and naked underneath the flames. And you shall see your little children weeping, weeping till their eyes do melt and slide like jelly down their faces, till their pink flesh falls black and crackling from their bones. The stranger comes, he comes, he comes, to scourge us for our sins. Prayers cannot stay his wrath, no more than tears can quench the flame of dragons. Only blood can do that. Your blood, my blood, their blood. Then he raised his right arm and jabbed the stump of his missing hand at Rainus's hill behind him, at the dragon pit, black against the stars. There the demons dwell, up there, fire and blood, blood and fire. This is their city. If you would make it yours, first you must destroy them. If you would cleanse yourself of sin, first must you bathe in the dragon's blood, for only blood can quench the fires of hell. From ten thousand throats, a cry went up. Kill them! Kill them! And like some vast beast with ten thousand legs, the lambs began to move, shoving and pushing, waving their torches, brandishing swords and knives and other cruder weapons, walking and running through the streets and alleys toward the dragon pit. Some thought better and slipped away to home, but for every man who left, three more appeared to join these dragon slayers. By the time they reached the hill of Rhaenys, their number had doubled. High atop Egon's high hill across the city, Mushroom watched their attack unfold from the roof of Magor's Holdfast with the queen, her sons, and members of her court. The night was black and overcast, the torches so numerous that it was as if all the stars had come down from the sky to storm the dragon pit, the fool says. As soon as word had reached her that the shepherd's savage flock was on the march, Rhaenyra sent riders to Sir Balon at the Old Gate and Sir Garth at the Dragon Gate, commanding them to disperse the lambs, seize the shepherd, and defend the royal dragons. But with the city in such turmoil, it was far from certain that the riders had won through, even if they had. What loyal gold cloaks remained were too few to have any hope of success. Her grace had as well commanded them to halt the black water in its flow, says Mushroom. When Prince Joffrey pleaded with his mother to let him ride forth with their own knights and those from White Harbor, the queen refused. 
If they take that hill, this one will be next, she said. We will need every sword here to defend the castle. They will kill the dragons, Prince Joffrey said, anguished. Or the dragons will kill them, his mother said, unmoved. Let them burn, let them burn, the realm will not long miss them. Mother, what if they kill Tyraxes? the young prince said. The queen did not believe it. They are vermin, drunks and fools, and gutter rats. One taste of dragon flame, and they will run. At that, the fool mushroom spoke up, saying, Drunks they may be, but a drunken man knows not fear. Fools, aye, but a fool can kill a king. Rats, that too, but a thousand rats can bring down a bear. I saw it happen once, down there in Flea Bottom. This time, Queen Rhaenyra did not laugh, bidding her fool to hold his tongue or lose it. Her grace turned back to the parapets. Only mushrooms saw Prince Joffrey go sulking off, if his testimony can be believed. And Mushroom had been told to hold his tongue. It was only when the watchers on the roof heard Cyrax roar that the prince's absence was noted. That was too late. No! The queen was heard to say, I forbid it! But even as she spoke, her dragon flapped up from the yard, perched for half a heartbeat atop the castle battlements, then launched herself into the night, with the queen's son clinging to her back, a sword in hand. After him! Rhaenyra shouted. All of you! Every man, every boy, to horse! Go after him! Bring him back! Bring him back! He does not know! My son! My sweet son! My son! Seven men did ride down from the Red Keep that night, into the madness of the city. Munkin tells us they were men of honor, duty-bound to obey their queen's commands. Septim Eustace would have us believe that their hearts had been touched by a mother's love for her son. Mushroom names them dolts and dastards, eager for some rich reward, and too dull to believe that they might die. For once, it may be that all three of our chroniclers have the truth of it, at least in part. Our septum, our maester, and our fool do agree upon their names. The seven who rode were Sir Medric Manderley, the heir to White Harbor, Sir Lorith Lansale, and Sir Harald Dark, knights of the Queen's Guard, Sir Harmon of the Reeds, called Iron Banger, Sir Giles Ronwood, an exiled knight from Dorne, Sir William Royce, armed with the famed Valerian sword Lamentation, and Sir Glendale Good, Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard. Six squires, eight gold cloaks, and twenty men at arms rode with the seven champions as well, but their names, alas, have not come down to us. Many a singer has made many a song of the ride of the seven, and many a tale has been told of the perils they face as they fought their way across the city. Whilst King's Landing burned around them, and the alleys of Flea Bottom ran red with blood, certain of those songs even have some truth to them, but it is beyond our purview to recount them here. Songs are sung of Prince Joffrey's last flight as well. Some singers can find glory even in a privy, Mushroom tells us, but it takes a fool to speak the truth. Though we cannot doubt the prince's courage, his act was one of folly. We shall not pretend to any understanding of the bond between dragon and dragon rider. Wiser heads have pondered that mystery for centuries. We do know, however, that dragons are not horses to be ridden by any man who throws a saddle on their backs. Cyrax was the queen's dragon. She had never known another rider. Though Prince Joffrey was known to her by sight and scent, a familiar presence whose fumbling at her chains excited no alarm. The great yellow she-dragon wanted no part of him astride her. In his haste to be away before he could be stopped, the prince had vaulted onto Cyrax without the benefit of saddle or whip. His intent, we must presume, was either to fly Cyrax into battle, or, more likely, to cross the city to the dragon pit and his own Tyraxes. Mayhaps, he meant to loose the other pit dragons as well.
Joffrey never reached the Hill of Rhaenys. Once in the air, Cyrax twisted beneath him, fighting to be free of this unfamiliar rider. And from below, stones and spears and arrows flew at him from the hands of the shepherd's blood-soaked lambs, maddening the dragon even further. Two hundred feet above Flea Bottom, Prince Joffrey slid from the dragon's back and plunged to the earth. Near a juncture, where five alleys came together, the prince's fall came to its bloody end. He crashed first onto a steep pitched roof before rolling off to fall another forty feet amidst a shower of broken tiles. We are told that the fall broke his back, that shards of slate rained down upon him like knives, that his own sword tore loose of his hands and pierced him through the belly. In Flea Bottom, men still speak of a candlemaker's daughter named Robin, who cradled the broken prince in her arms and gave him comfort as he died. But there is more of legend than of history in that tale. Mother, forgive me, Joffrey supposedly said with his last breath. Though men still argue whether he was speaking of his mother, the queen, or praying to the mother above. Thus perished Joffrey Valerian, Prince of Dragonstone, and heir to the Iron Throne, the last of Queen Rhaenyra's sons by Laenor Valerian, or the last of her bastards by Sir Harwin Strong, depending on which truth one chooses to believe. The mob was not long in falling on his corpse. The Candlemaker's daughter Robin, if she ever existed, was driven off. Looters tore the boots from the prince's feet, and the sword from his belly, then stripped him of his fine blood-stained clothes. Others, still more savage, began ripping at his body. Both of his hands were cut off, so the scum of the street might claim the rings on his fingers. The prince's right foot was hacked through at the ankle, and a butcher's apprentice was sawing at his neck to claim his head when the seven who rode came thundering up. There, amidst the stinks of Flea Bottom, a battle was waged in the mud and blood for possession of Prince Joffrey's body. The Queen's knights, at last, reclaimed the boy's remains, save for his missing foot, though three of the seven fell in the fighting. The Dornishman, Sir Giles Ronwood, was pulled from his horse and bludgeoned to death, whilst Sir William Royce was felled by a man who leapt down from a rooftop to land upon his back. His famed sword, Lamentation, was torn from his hand and carried off, never to be found again. Most grievous of all was the fate of Sir Glendon Good, attacked from behind by a man with a torch who set his long white cloak afire. As the flames licked at his back, his horse reared in terror and threw him, and the mob swarmed over him, tearing him to pieces. Only twenty years of age, Sir Glendon had been Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard for less than a day. And even as blood flowed in the alleys of Flea Bottom, another battle raged round the dragon pit above, atop the hill of Rhaenys. Mushroom was not wrong. Swarms of starving rats do indeed bring down bulls and bears and lions, when there are enough of them. No matter how many the bull or bear might kill, there are always more biting at the great beast's legs, clinging to its belly, running up its back. So it was that night. The shepherd's rats were armed with spears, long axes, spiked clubs, and half a hundred other kinds of weapons, including both longbows and crossbows. Gold cloaks from the dragon gates, obedient to the queen's command, issued forth from their barracks to defend the hill, but found themselves unable to cut through the mobs and turned back, whilst the messenger sent to the old gate never arrived. The dragon pit had its own contingent of guards, the dragon keepers, but those proud warriors were only seven and seventy in number, and fewer than fifty had the watch that night. Though their swords drank deep of the blood of the attackers, the numbers were against them. When the shepherd's lambs smashed through the doors, the towering main gates, sheathed in bronze and iron, were too strong to assault, but the building had a score of lesser entrances, and came clambering through the windows. The dragon keepers were overwhelmed and soon slaughtered. Mayhaps the attackers hoped to take the dragons within whilst they slept, but the clangor of the assault made that impossible. Those who lived to tell tales afterward speak of shouts and screams, 
the smell of blood in the air, the splintering of oak and iron doors beneath crude rams, and the blows of countless axes. Seldom have so many men rushed so eagerly onto their funeral pyres, Grandmaster Munkin wrote. But a madness was upon them. There were four dragons housed within the dragon pits. By the time the first of the attackers came pouring out onto the sands, all four were roused, awake, and angry. No two chroniclers agree on how many men and women died that night beneath the dragon pit's great dome. Two hundred, or two thousand, be that as it may. For every man who perished, ten suffered burns, and yet survived. Trapped within the pit, hemmed in by walls and dome, and bound by heavy chains, the dragons could not fly away or use their wings to evade attacks and swoop down on their foes. Instead, they fought with horns and claws and teeth, turning this way and that like bulls in a flea-bottom rat pit. But these bulls could breathe fire. The dragon pit was transformed into a fiery hell where burning men staggered screaming through the smoke, the flesh sloughing off their blackened bones. Right, Septim Eustace. But for every man who died, ten more appeared, shouting that the dragons must needs die. One by one, they did. Shrykos was the first dragon to succumb, slain by a woodsman known as Hob the Hewer, who leapt onto her neck, driving his axe down into the beast's skull as Shrykos roared and twisted, trying to throw him off. Seven blows did Hob deliver with his legs locked round the dragon's neck and each time his axe came down, he roared out the name of one of the seven. It was the seventh blow, the stranger's blow, that slew the dragon, crashing through scale and bones into the beast's brain, if Eustace is to be believed. Morgul, it is written, was slain by the burning knight, a huge brute of a man in heavy armor who rushed headlong into the dragon's flame with spear in hand, thrusting its point into the beast's eye repeatedly, even as Dragonflame melted the steel plate that encased him and devoured the flesh within. Prince Joffrey's Tyraxes retreated back into his lair, we are told, roasting so many would-be dragon slayers as they rushed after him that its entrance was soon made impassable by their corpses. But it must be recalled that each of these man-made caves had two entrances, one fronting onto the sands of the pits and the other opening onto the hillside. It was the shepherd himself who directed his followers to break through the back door. Hundreds did, howling through the smoke with swords and spears and axes. As Tyraxes turned, his chains fouled, entangling him in a web of steel that fatally limited his movement. Half a dozen men and one woman would later claim to have dealt the dragon the mortal blow. Like his master, Tyraxes suffered further indignity even in death, as the shepherd's followers sliced the membranes from his wings and tore them into ragged strips to fashion dragon skin cloaks. The last of the four pit dragons did not die so easily. Legend has it that Dreamfire had broken free of two of her chains at Queen Helena's death. The remaining bonds she burst now, tearing the stanchions from the walls as the mob rushed her, then plunging into them with tooth and claw, ripping men apart and tearing off their limbs, even as she loosed her terrible fires. As the others closed about her, she took wing, circling the cavernous interior of the dragon pit and swooping down to attack the men below. Tyraxes, Shrykos, and Morgul killed scores. There can be little doubt, but Dreamfire slew more than all three of them combined. Hundreds fled in terror of her flames, but hundreds more, drunk or mad, or possessed of the warrior's own courage, pushed through to the attack. Even at the apex of the dome, the dragon was within easy reach of archer and crossbowmen, and arrows and quarrels flew at Dreamfire wherever she went, at such close range that some even punched through her scales. Whenever she lighted, men swarmed to the attack, driving her back into the air. Twice the dragon flew at the dragon pit's great bronze gates, only to find them closed and barred and defended by ranks of spears. Unable to flee, Dreamfire returned to the attack, 
savaging her tormentors until the sands of the pit were strewn with charred corpses, and the very air was thick with smoke and the smell of burned flesh. Yet still, the spears and arrows flew. The end came when a crossbow bolt nicked one of the dragon's eyes. Half blind and maddened by a dozen lesser wounds, Dreamfire spread her wings and flew straight up at the great dome above in a last desperate attempt to break into the open sky. Already weakened by blasts of dragon flame, the dome cracked under the force of the impact, and a moment later, half of it came tumbling down, crushing both dragon and dragon slayers under tons of broken stone and rubble. The storming of the dragon pit was done. Four of the Targaryen dragons lay dead, though at hideous cost. Yet the shepherd was not yet triumphant, for the queen's own dragon remained alive and free. And as the burned and bloody survivors of the carnage in the pit came stumbling from the smoking ruins, Cyrax descended upon them from above. Mushroom was amongst those watching with Queen Rhaenyra on the roof of Magor's Holdfast. A thousand shrieks and shouts echoed across the city, mingling with the dragon's roar. He tells us. Atop the hill of Rhaenys, the dragon pit wore a crown of yellow fire, burning so bright it seemed as if the sun was rising. Even the queen trembled as she watched, the tears glistening on her cheeks. Never have I seen a sight more terrible, more glorious. Many of the queen's companions on the rooftop fled, the dwarf tells us. Fearing that the fires would soon engulf the entire city, even the Red Keep atop Egon's high hill, others took themselves to the castle sept to pray for deliverance. Rhaenyra herself wrapped her arms about her last living son, Egon the Younger, clutching him fiercely to her bosom. Nor would she lose her hold upon him until that dread moment when Cyrax fell. Unchained and riderless, Cyrax might have easily flown away from the madness. The sky was hers. She could have returned to the Red Keep, left the city entirely, taken wing for Dragonstone. Was it the noise and fire that drew her to the hill of Rhaenys? The roars and screams of the dying dragons, the smell of burning flesh. We cannot know, no more than we can know why Cyrax chose to descend upon the shepherds' mobs, rending them with tooth and claw and devouring dozens, when she might as easily have rained fire on them from above, for in the sky no man may have harmed her. We can only report what happened, as Mushroom, Septim Eustace, and Grand Maester Munkin have set it down for us. Many a conflicting tale is told of the death of the Queen's Dragon. Munkin credits Hob the Hewer and his axe, though this is almost certainly mistaken. Could the same man truly have slain two dragons on the same night, and in the same manner? Some speak of an unarmed spearman, a blood-soaked giant, who leapt from the dragon pit's broken dome onto the dragon's back. Others relate how a knight named Sir Warwick Wheaton slashed a wing from Cyrax with a Valerian steel sword. Lamentation, most like. A crossbowman named Bean would claim the kill afterward, boasting of it in many a wine sink and tavern until one of the Queen's loyalists grew tired of his wagging tongue and cut it out. Possibly, all these worthies, save Hob, played some role in the dragon's demise, but the tale most oft heard in King's Landing named the shepherd himself as the dragon slayer. As others fled, the story went, the one-handed prophet stood fearless and alone against the ravening beast, calling on the seven for succor, till the warrior himself took form, thirty feet tall. In his hand was a black blade made of smoke that turned to steel as he swung it, cleaving the head of Cyrax from her body. And so the tale was told, even by Septim Eustace, in his account of these dark days. And so the singer sang for many years thereafter. The loss of both her dragon and her son left Rhaenyra Targaryen ashen and inconsolable, Mushroom tells us. Attended only by the fool, she retreated to her chambers whilst her counselors conferred. King's Landing was lost. All agreed. They must needs abandon the city. Reluctantly, 
her grace was persuaded to leave the next day at dawn. With the mud gate in the hands of her foes, and all the ships along the river burned or sunk, Rhaenyra and a small band of followers slipped out through the Dragon Gate, intending to make their way up the coast to Duskendale. With her rode the brothers Manderley, four surviving Queensguard, Sir Balin Birch, and twenty gold cloaks, four of the Queen's ladies-in-waiting, and her last surviving son, Egon the Younger. Mushroom remained behind, along with other members of the court, amongst them Lady Misery and Septim Eustace, Sir Garth the Hare Lip, captain of the Gold Cloaks at the Dragon Gate, was charged with the defense of the castle, a task for which the Hare Lip proved to have little appetite. Her grace had not been gone half a day when Sir Perkin the Flea and his gutter knights appeared outside the gates demanding that the castle yield. Though outnumbered ten to one, the queen's garrison might still have resisted, but Sir Garth chose instead to strike Rhaenyra's banners, open his gates, and trust to the mercy of the foe. The flea proved to have no mercy. Garth the Harelip was dragged before him and beheaded, along with twenty other knights still loyal to the queen. Amongst them, Sir Harmon of the Reeds, the Iron Banger, who had been one of the seven who rode. Nor was the Mistress of Whispers, Lady Myceria of Lys, spared on the account of her sex. Taken whilst attempting to flee, the White Worm was whipped naked throughout the city, from the Red Keep to the Gate of the Gods. If she were still alive, by the time they reached the gate, Sir Perkin promised she would be spared and allowed to go. She made it only half that distance, dying on the cobblestones with hardly a patch of her pale white skin left upon her back. Septim Eustace feared for his own life. Only the mother's mercy saved me, he writes, though it seems more likely that Sir Perkin did not wish to provoke the enmity of the faith. The flea also freed all the prisoners found in the dungeons below the castle, amongst them Grand Maester Orwile and the sea snake Lord Corliss Valerian. Both were on hand the next day to bear witness as Sir Perkin's gangling squire, Tristane, mounted the Iron Throne. So too was the Dowager Queen, Alicent of House Hightower. Down in the Black Cells, Sir Perkin's men even found King Egon's former Master of Coin, Sir Tyland Lannister, still alive, though Rhaenyra's torturers had blinded him, pulled out his fingernails and toenails, cut off his ears, and relieved him of his manhood. King Egon's Master of Whispers, Larry Strong the Clubfoot, fared much better. The Lord of Harrenhal emerged intact from wherever he had been hiding. Like a man risen from the grave, he came striding through the halls of the Red Keep as if he had never left them. To be greeted warmly by Sir Perkin, the flea, and take a place of honor at the side of his new king. The Queen's flight brought no peace to King's Landing. Three kings reigned over the city, each on his own hill, yet for their unfortunate subjects, there was no law, no justice, no protection, says the true telling. No man's home was safe, nor any maiden's virtue. This chaos endured for more than a moon's turn. Maesters and other scholars writing of this time oft take their cue from Munkin and speak of the moon of the Three Kings. Other scholars prefer the moon of madness. But this is a misnomer, as the shepherd never claimed kingship, styling himself a simple son of the Seven. Yet it cannot be denied that he held sway over tens of thousands from the ruins of the Dragon Pit. The heads of the five dragons that his followers had slain had been set up on posts, and every night the shepherd would appear amongst them to preach. With the dragons dead, and the threat of immolation no longer imminent, the prophet turned his wrath upon the highborn and wealthy. Only the poor and humble would ever see the halls of the gods, he declared. Lords and knights and rich men would be cast down in their pride and avarice to hell. Cast off your silks and satins, and cloth your nakedness in rough-spun robes, he told his followers. 
Throw away your shoes and walk barefoot through the world as the father made you. Thousands obeyed, but thousands more turned away, and each night the crowds that came to hear the prophet grew smaller. At the other end of the street of the sisters, Gaiman Palehair's queer kingdom blossomed atop Visenya's hill. The court of this four-year-old bastard king was made up of whores, mummers, and thieves, whilst gangs of ruffians, sellswords, and drunkards defended his rule. One decree, after another, came down from the House of Kisses, where the child king had his seat, each more outrageous than the last. Gaiman decreed that girls should henceforth be equal with boys in the matter of inheritance, that the poor be given bread and beer in times of famine, that men who had lost limbs in war must afterward be fed and housed by whichever lord they had been fighting for when the loss took place. Gaiman decreed that husbands who beat their wives should they themselves be beaten, irrespective of what the wives had done to warrant such chastisement. These edicts were almost certainly the work of a Dornish whore named Sylvania Sand. Reputedly, the paramour of the little king's mother, Essie, if Mushroom is to be believed. Royal decrees also issued forth from atop Egon's high hill, where Sir Perkin's catspaw Tristane sat the Iron Throne. But those were of a very different nature. The Squire King began by repealing Queen Rhaenyra's unpopular taxes and dividing the coin in the royal treasury amongst his own followers. He followed that, with a general cancellation of debt, raised three score of his gutter knights to the ranks of the nobility, and answered King Gaiman's promise of free bread and beer for the starving by granting the poor the right to take rabbits, hares, and deer from the king's wood as well, though not elk nor boar. All the while, Sir Perkin the Flea was recruiting scores of surviving gold cloaks to Tristane's banner. With their swords, he took control of the Dragon Gate, the King Gate, and the Lion Gate, giving him four of the city's seven gates and more than half of the towers along its walls. In the early days after the Queen's flight, the Shepherd was by far the most powerful of the city's three kings. But as the nights passed, the number of his followers continued to dwindle. The small folk of this city woke as if it was a bad dream, Septim Eustace wrote, and like the sinners waking cold and sober after a night of drunken debauchery and revel, they turned away in shame, hiding their faces from one another and hoping to forget. Though the dragons were dead and the queen fled, such was the power of the Iron Throne that the commons still looked to the Red Keep when hungry or afraid. So as the power of the Shepherd waned on the hill of Rhaenys, the power of King Tristane Truefire, as he now styled himself, waxed atop Egon's high hill. Much and more was happening at Tumbleton as well, and it is there we must turn our gaze next. And with that, our look into the madness that is happening at King's Landing has to come to a pause, at least for the time being. I know this is only the first half of the chapter, but good god, I feel like so much has happened with just the insanity going on throughout the city. I mean, you have a complete upheaval and revolution going on at the hands of the Shepherd, and then with that you have two other kings rising up and taking advantage of the madness, not to mention basically all of Rhaenyra's faction of dragons being killed in like maybe 10 pages in the book. It is wild. Not even by other dragon riders, mind you. These are just regular people that like ants just went horde mode and managed to take out all of these dragons, some of which we didn't even really hear that much about at all. It definitely makes me wonder to what extent we'll be seeing the lesser discussed dragons on screen in the next season of House of the Dragon like Morgul, or if we will more or less only see their death. I think though the most interesting part of this chapter, so far at least, is 
Cyrax and the fact that another one of Rhaenyra's children is taken from her as Joffrey fell from the back of Cyrax and it really gets interesting because while it's understandable what happened with Joffrey and how he died thinking about the shepherd literally making manifest the spirit of the warrior god into a giant knight to slay Cyrax it almost kind of reminds me of the end scene of Oblivion if any of you guys are a fan of the Elder Scrolls series you'll know what I'm talking about and I think it's interesting that Septim Eustace even gives credit to this tale, and it is talked about as if it's fact. And given the Game of Thrones universe and the fact that we do know that obviously dragons exist, obviously magic is a force in that universe, it's not entirely unbelievable to think that that happened. And if it does, it's interesting to think about the greater implication to the religion of the Seven and or maybe other dark magic in play. That is something I am really going to be interested to see how they portray in the next season. And if they even include that, man, I would love to see a giant phantasmal knight slay a dragon with good CGI animation. How awesome would that be? While we will be taking a break at King's Landing for the time being to focus on the Tumbleton story arc and all of the characters involved with that for the second half of this chapter, we will be finishing off with a little bit more at Dragonstone before this comes to an end. I do have the second half of this chapter recorded, I just need to edit it. Uh, I will try to get that out as quickly as I can. Again, sorry for missing an upload, it's been kind of crazy this week. I've had a lot of real life issues going on, stuff with my car, and then I've also been pursuing a lot of athletic goals as I'm trying to make a debut into amateur boxing. Let me tell you, with how draining a lot of that training gets makes me wish I could make the warrior spirit manifest from time to time just to have some extra energy to get the things done that I need to. Anyways, I digress. I will be trying to get that next chapter out as soon as we can. Uh, I do have to say that uh, we are not given a tremendous amount of break from all the crazy going-ons that have been happening. Uh, the Dance of the Dragons continues to be quite the dance indeed as we go back to Tumbleton and look a bit at some of the power struggle that's going on with Hard Hugh Hammer's King aspirations and all of the obvious contentions that are going to arise with that. So I won't go too much deeper to avoid spoilers, but I I will have that chapter out as soon as I can. But as always, I want to know what you guys think. What is the thing from this chapter that you're going to be most excited to see in season two? Is it going to be the crazy conflicts in the street as the gold cloaks face off against the shepherd's hordes? Is it going to be the storming of the dragon pits? Is it going to be the warrior spirit fighting Cyrax? So many good things that we can look forward to. So let me know in the comments what you guys want to see the most. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out.